I think there's a lot to unpack because a lot's happened in the last few years. Um, I think, you know, if I lead with the obvious, inflation is one factor that we just simply can't ignore. In particular, I think the compounding effect of inflation is something that we really have to take into account because there's this snowballing that's happening. Um, one trend we highlight in, in our report, obviously, is the, the impact of cost of living and how those have been rising. And so even though inflation growth is decelerating in many cases, prices themselves haven't actually yet come down. And so over the last few years, things are really becoming exponentially more expensive. And so, you know, this is kind of that catalyst to what you were just teeing up, that financial focus of today. And so increased cautiousness is something we can definitely expect, anticipate, and, you know, kind of related within that, we see a rise in things like omni shopping across retail channels as consumers are really definitely trying to seek that value across a wide gamut of outlets. And so, you know, another thing we also have to take into account then is that prevalence of the recessionary mindset. So really two big trends that we can, you know, keep an eye on and hopefully monitor throughout the year. Um, first, of course, related to that intense scrutiny we just talked about is the kind of cutbacks on discretionary spending that we expect. So everything from holidays to gym memberships, especially out of home activities, you know, these are the types of things that are all likely to feel the brunt of consumer cutbacks this year. Um, but another thing I found really interesting and telling was the future focus on items that consumers say they plan to either maintain or, or spend more on even. And so some of these things like paying off debt, focusing on savings and investments, and even a lot of consumers saying they want to spend more on education, I think really speaks to a sentiment for survival, if you will. So there's many ways consumers are really focused on not just cutting costs, but finding a path to a stronger, more stable, and perhaps more prosperous tomorrow. So what is setting that spending tone for the year? I think it's expected when, you know, the, the results show that financial and job security were at the forefront of consumers' minds. But I think really interestingly, um, mental and physical wellness were kind of right next to that at the top of priorities right now. So there's this trifecta that's formed between financial, mental, and physical health that's really driving consumer intentions. And I think, you know, within that, there's one thing we can't forget that you know, our financial health is often what feeds our ability to kind of service the rest of our lives. And so I think that's kind of the perspective we have to take here that there's this blanket of financial focus that is paramount right now. But right within that is our mental and physical health that that are, you know, tied at top priorities today. You know, we definitely need to anticipate higher levels of scrutiny on consumer spending. Um, consumers are going to be looking to justify the necessity or the benefit of every purchase. And so I think there needs to be utmost clarity on the value added by your brand to their lives. And so in our analysis of saving strategies by consumers, we can kind of see different preferences really coming to the forefront that I think brands can really use as a guide moving forward. So we see things like loyalty points being preferred over you know remaining inherently brand loyal. Um, we see discount stores or buying in bulk. These are kind of some of the strategies that are prevailing right now over things like down trading or you know going down to a smaller pack size in order to save. And so th these types of you know insights are showing us how consumers are seeking really tangible value from what they're buying. Um, they kind of want to see and feel the difference of you know the savings right in their pocket, so to speak say you know it sounds simple but investing really in the fullest view of measurement that you can across channels I think is so central to eliminating your blind spots to profit nearly 50% of global consumers say they're shopping regularly across that omni spectrum of in stores and online and that's for their everyday kind of CPG needs so you know knowing which channels are incrementally driving growth for your brand I think is so valuable right now a really great question to ask ourselves is 
you know, not missing that moment or missing the mark. And I think innovation is definitely one of those areas. So um, here at NIQ, we have our bases business unit, for example, our innovation experts. And, um, you know, we conducted some really intriguing research around the importance of innovating through moments of crisis. So those who continue to innovate through the crises we saw from 2019 to 2022, for example, you know, we isolated that group of innovators um, and we were able to see that those who continued to innovate in that period were able to see growth in dollar share and also retail relevance. And then we, by comparison, looked at the group of non-innovators, so those who kind of took that crisis moment as a, a point to kind of pause and stay stable. And those were actually the, the instances where we saw um, overall losses from a dollar share and retail relevance perspective. So, you know, it just goes to show how quickly you can lose relevance with consumers today. And so, you know, people are making such rapid shifts in the criteria, values, and kind of purchase routines to leverage, you know, in their spending decisions. And so you really need to kind of keep up with that pace of innovation. And I think, again, innovation is just my recommendation for a great way to kind of stay ahead. I think, yeah, with that mindset, there's there's even more we have to consider. You know, brands need to be aware of and kind of capitalize on some of the unique positions of our market today. And I think CPG is actually positioned very uniquely. You know, we were talking about kind of the broader swath of categories a little bit earlier things like savings and investments versus, you know, discretionary spending. And I think, you know, we we learned through our research that consumer packaged goods are positioned quite well in the minds of consumers right now. So, you know, we have a really great segmentation of the economic divide um, that we use in this research. And so this kind of looks at consumers across the scope of whether they were financially impacted or not in the last year. And one of the things that really stood out to me is that across those different groups, all of them say they plan to spend more on CPG in the year ahead. So I think brands really need to hone in on why they matter. Um, think about the role of maybe something like small luxuries, because I think that could be a huge opportunity. Because consumers, you know, they might not feel they can splurge on those bigger ticket items in today's environment, but snackable, affordable moments of indulgence especially, you know, when they're otherwise feeling so pressured, you know, that's a huge runway for, you know, certain CPG products to scale as affordable pleasures in tough times, I think. For those listening who haven't heard enough about us or even our partnership, you know, I think there's, there's really a world of consumer intelligence that we can help power and inform on. You know, we can help understand, really, I keep saying this, the fullest view, the fullest depth of consumer spending potential. You know, and what I mean by that is, you know, we can help assess market development and unpenetrated green fields. We can help you dive down to category development levels to understand, again, development or expansion opportunities. And taking that even further, we can layer in nuances based upon, you know, consumer segments of interest tie that back to consumer values. We specialize in kind of uncovering the consumer use cases that amplify businesses by connecting the right assortment with the right and best price points and even supporting the right mix of promotions to kind of ensure that you're aware of the best channels that these products need to be available in and how they can best be activated in the right locations. So it's really quite a blend of art and science, I think, but um, it's really the best bet in today's world to really strategically align to profitability in a time where true growth is so hard to come by. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I think it's, it's a really important lens to think about related to the next three, five, ten years ahead. Today, it's all about contending with cost of living and affordability. That's front and center in our minds today. But I think as we're personally confronted with really fundamental sustainability issues you know in our own neighborhoods in our own backyards we start to see extreme weather events that are far beyond the norm or perhaps maybe like poor air quality or something is something we're confronted with in the cities we live in more so than before i think things like this as we're forced to think about how we need and want sustainable ways of living they're going to see this intertwining of sustainability and affordability 
demand is on the rise, consumers are seeking key attributes, but they're doing so across a really broad set of price tiers and especially with an emphasis on kind of the discount end of things right now. So for companies, this means thinking really long term about how things like e-commerce fulfillment can be done in a cost, but also like environmentally conscious way. How manufacturing can be both sustainably able to protect the bottom line, but also the health and future of the ecosystem that we're kind of delivering to. And even consumers themselves are really starting to expect more. They want brands that are understanding and anticipating that shift towards perhaps, you know, deglobalizing supply chains, local um, kind of serving many needs of consumers, both from a trust perspective and also because of the sustainability advantages that offers. So I think brands need to really shift towards this type of thinking so that you don't fall to the wayside of options that are emerging that, that do rise to this occasion. I love that question. I feel like we talk so much about the business side of things and it's nice to kind of bring it back home, so to speak. So I think, you know, it's such a great tangent because I'm really passionate about the work I do here at NIQ. I think if I were to say what my mission was as a thought leader in this industry, I strive to demystify consumer behavior to help companies understand the crux of what's driving intentions to buy, intentions to consume, and really kind of connect that to how to help companies better monetize their products and, and services around those drivers. Another good one, I think. I've definitely learned a lot over the last decade here at MIQ, and I would say, you know, one of the biggest lessons I've learned is probably how essential and powerful it is to leverage a global footprint when you're understanding the full scope of consumer behavior. Um, you know, in order to gauge geographic or cultural nuances, even to be able to identify trends before they scale, which is so powerful. I think there's a lot of value in being able to identify patterns when you have a view of cross-country behavior. Um, it allows you to benchmark, I, like I said, identify early indicators across markets. So I feel really fortunate to work for such a global organization. Um, NIQ is in many ways like a literal library of endless resources to draw from. So for me, it's, it's truly like a haven for someone who's curious about consumer data. And I think for companies, you know, I love being that partner that, that companies turn to to kind of understand the fullest scope of, of what's going on.